uh, Mighty Lou were talking about. It's still about contact and getting the and getting the vote out. Next, um, and there's, these are just some other recommendations that happened: the California Voting Rights Act, California Voter Participation Act. Um, I have to put down the Los Angeles Charter Amendment One and Two and Fifteen and E. And, and there's there's actually going to be two charter amendments on this election. I'm um, the author of those. Uh, basically, they were to move the election from odd to even years. This year, we had to do a, a small technical change because the state legislature moved the 2020 election from the uh, from June primary to March. Okay, and and so now this uh, technical uh, change allows us to move the city election to wherever the state moved it. I made a mistake. I put down June and November. Uh, on the first charter amendment, yeah. and so now I'm basically saying the, the, wherever the yeah. state puts the election, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. And so you can see all of these changes have also contributed. Next. Um, um, other uh, unconventional recommendations, uh, the uh, U.S. Constitution does not prohibit uh, uh, non-citizens from voting in local elections. It does prohibit them from voting for Congress in the Senate, but it does not prohibit them, and historically, many jurisdictions, including today, the city, excuse me, in Maryland, there are five cities that allow non-citizens to vote for local elections, okay? Mm -hmm. Historically, New York City allowed non-citizens to vote until up till the 1950s, um, and so there's a variety of different reasons, right? Um, uh, California, California uh, does prohibit the uh, voting of non-citizens, however, I'm confused about this. I haven't really taken a look at it. San Francisco School District is allowing non-citizens to vote. Okay? And they're being challenged in court, etc. So it's a very interesting thing that, that's happening there. Uh, but of course, we're allowing non-citizens to vote in neighborhood councils that you mentioned. They can vote there. There's a quasi kind of government. They get $50,000 a year to spend and all that. So if you're kind of breaking that up, uh, the city of Huntington uh, Park has appointed non-citizens to uh, their, their commissions. Um, not, and then the state just passed a law to allow non-citizens to uh, be appointed to state boards uh, and, and things of that nature. So you're seeing that change. Next, unconventional recommendations that I've been working with my uh, students, mandatory voting. We're totally against this. It doesn't, it won't work for the populations that don't vote. It'll actually, from our research, it'll actually exacerbate the issue and cause more economic hardship. Uh, and then two, the internet voting, we've studied this, and especially now, we don't want the Russians voting. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, next. Um, so then, we're, here's where we are in terms of constitutional officers right there. On the first column, you have the, yeah. the position, who's the incumbent, and who are the two that are, are, are uh, um, in, in, the, in the final. Let me give you some stats about that next. All right. This is the constitutional officers in California. Just four years ago, of the 10 of them, these are the 10 statewide elected positions, right? Nine were white, one was a person of color, okay? Today, it's five and five. And after this election, it will probably be seven or eight, maybe even. Uh, you can see the incredible transformation of the governing elite of California, okay? Um, next, you'll see the, the partisanship. In 1994, uh, it was five Democrats, five Republicans, but in, in 2002, 10 Democrats. And then you, you see all the way to 2009 was uh, three. Those three were um, uh, uh, Schwarzenegger, uh, Poisoner, and Maldonado who got appointed. But then it goes back to uh, all, all 10 are Democrats. And we obviously uh, uh, believe that all, that all nine definitely will be Democrats and, and maybe one kind of state. There'll certainly be no Republican uh, elected statewide. Uh, next, um, this is the California vote for Democratic gubernatorial race, and just follow the blue is the vote for Democrats, 47% in 02, 39 in 06, that was Schwarzenegger running for re-election. I don't have here the 2003 election, which was the recall election, where Schwarzenegger, I like to remember, remind people, did not get a majority of the vote uh, in, in that election. Uh, um, and then in 2010, you see 54% and then and 14, 60%. Uh, I predict that Newsom will actually beat that number and have over 60% of the vote, okay? Next, and this is the state vote for president, okay? And again, follow the blue, uh, in 2000, uh, it was uh, uh, Gore with 53, Kerry with 54, Obama 61, Obama 60, and then Hillary 62, okay? You can just see that trend uh, in, in, increasing, all right, next. 
and um, then this is the racial makeup of the congressional delegation uh, uh, in California. Remember, we have 53 members of Congress, 39 are Democrats. This is the 39 Democrats. Of the 39 Democrats, 21 are white and 18 are people of color. That's incredibly diverse. Look at in terms of gender. Okay, 23 are male, 16 are female. That's not equity, but it's closer than any any other place. Okay, and so it's an incredibly diverse delegation. Okay, incredibly diverse. As a matter of fact, I think there's only three white, male, non-Hispanic, non-Jews on the congressional. <laughs> and I'm really slicing that one. Okay? But only three ma white, male, non-Hispanic, non-Jews on the congressional delegation. Right, less than 10%, okay? That's pretty incredible given 50 years ago, 30 years ago. Next. Okay, this is the Republican delegation. Oh, There's 14 members of Congress from uh, in California, or the Republicans. All 14 are white, okay? And 13 are male. You know, and, yeah, and then two years, she just got elected two years ago. It was 14 males as well for the last uh, eight years before we got elected. All right, next. All right, conclusions. Uh, there are more, uh, the voters are more democratic than ever before. The representatives are more big democratic. Than, yeah, big D. And, uh, and representatives are more than, uh, diverse than ever before. The policies are more progressive than ever before. And you can see that in terms of public opinion and actual uh, uh, voting. A couple of just more uh, uh, quick comments on, on, on the on the questions. Um, the um, um, will the Republicans know how to win elections? They know how to structure it to win. Mm -hmm. All right. As a, 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 and it really kind of the only way you can uh, combat, combat that is turnout. The literature in political science, especially for Latino politics. I could point to over 40 significant studies, incredibly well done, that show that if you contact a Latino voter, and then specific ways to contact them, that turnout will increase. Consistently, the data is overwhelming, right? And so then you say, why don't we contact them, okay? There's oftentimes no incentive to contact them because they live in heavily democratic districts that are already gonna be democratic. And so you have this catch-22, campaigns have a certain amount of money, they don't want to spend it on people that are already going to vote, etc. But the data is overwhelming, the, it's the lack of contact that you're putting resources in there. The problem with these studies is that they, are not, they don't talk about sustainable or scalable in terms of the experiments that they run. They run an experiment and they show turnout increases, overwhelming. <coughs> It's just that we can't scale that model up to a, a large because it will take so much, so much money. And so that's, uh, I think, an incredible uh, uh, distinction and turnout is, is really important. Um, I do want to make one comment about Orange County and the fact that it, it became Democrat for the first time. The big difference in Orange County and why Republicans will remain much more relevant there is the Asian population. Asians in Orange County in terms of voters, are extremely different than Asians in the rest of California. Okay? It's, a, it's generation. No, it's like, I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a little bit generational, yes, but so uh, a Asians uh, 20 years ago were voting 50 50 Democrat Republican. They voted for Obama and for Hillary and are voting Democrat even more than Latinos. Okay? Part of this whole transformation that has happened is as much Asian as it is Latino. The Asians have become incredibly progressive, except in Orange County. Okay? And the Republican Party has been very smart. If you take a look, who are they running? They run Asians, not in just that sort of uh, they run, They run Asians and they run women. Okay? And so the 39th district, where we have it, Royce's old district, there is a young, uh, Korean American female one, and you take a look. There's a uh, there's a uh, Asian female on the board of supervisors, Asian female in the state senate in a district that is over 15 percent Democratic points, and they won that district. Okay, it's that combination. And again, Republicans know strategically, tactically, and institutionally how to win elections where they are not the majority. Okay, and so uh, so kind of like. 
And the one more thing about the proposition. Proposition six is uh, clearly what was said before, but it's an infrastructure measure. When you flip it and say it's about investment, it can pass overwhelmingly. 73% of us voted for Measure M in LA County. And every time we put infrastructure before the voters, they vote yes. So you gotta, you gotta flip it and you do that. You need a no side. Yeah. Right. Correct. You said it. Yeah, yes, yes. You think yeah, you're yeah. smart enough to figure that out? That's, it's, you know, so. And then Proposition uh, 10, um, I, you know, I, I understand there's a lot of problems with it. Um, I was at a panel with a bunch of city, uh, at a city, League of Cities, et cetera. And there were mostly council members there. It's a local control issue. I said, how many of you are supporting Proposition 10? Almost none of them were. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're talking about it too. You know, you're constantly complaining about Sacramento, telling you what to do. Here they're freeing it up, and they, they, they didn't want the responsibility. <laughs> so, so unlike Sherry, I have no problem telling you to vote yes on Proposition 10. I think it's got a lot of problems, but I think it's also a great progressive issue. Wait a minute. Oh, Proposition 10. Yes, Proposition 10. Yeah. Okay. I'm also going to make the yes. following. I'm going to end with this. I'm going to make the following, that if you are a true progressive, you would vote for Kevin DeLeon. In the following sense. Diane Feinstein's going to win, okay? And the, she's going to win, okay? The more she wins by, the more it empowers the old way of thinking. I'm on a task to try to get that election as close as possible to communicate, not to Diane Feinstein, but to everybody, that there's a new progressive and they have an ability to impact that, okay? And so a vote for Kevin DeLeon doesn't mean them go to the state senate. It's a vote to communicate that progressives are on the move and we have to change that dynamic. Um, so, Tori, how are you going to vote for yeah. well, let, me just, let me just push back. I'll tell you what I see on the ground. What I see is determined people from moderates, recovering Republicans, centrists, and Democrats from center to left. What I see on the ground is hundreds and hundreds of people. And these debates happen about Die 5 versus KDL. They like shut down. They roll their eyes. And here's what they say. They say, we need to win. This is about taking our country back. And they, most of the people I know, will be voting for Diane Feinstein because of the things they've seen from her on DACA. I mean, I might argue she's more economically conservative. I might argue she's you know, old school, but what people see is judiciary, judiciary, yeah. judiciary. Yes. They see Senior Kamala Senior. Harris being a junior senator. She's great. She's great at interrogation. But they want, they understand that Democrats have to be smarter. You just finished telling us that the Republicans know how to win elections. They put up young Asian women, and then they have managed to keep Asian community in the vote in the Republican column in Orange County. Mm -hmm. Exactly why people should vote for Diane Feinstein. Because she it has seniority. You don't need two junior senators in California. You can't say, I'm gonna throw my vote away. We have to vote for power for the Democrats. So I I am tired of women, whether it's Nancy Pelosi or Hillary Clinton or Diane Feinstein being told, I mean, I'm 68, I'm getting to identify with these people in their 70s and 80s. And it's like, there's something that just stinks about it. And so I would say, we need to continue to do the grassroots organizing, do the relationship building, do the revitalization of the Democratic Party. I'm not so sure that Kevin DeLeon is the leader. And so I think we need to vote for Diane Feinstein, and we need to revivify the Democratic Party. I think these internal battles are irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Just tell me what I'm Can saying. I just, right? I'd like to make a point, mm -hmm. and this is probably not what anybody wants to hear. But mm -hmm. I will say is take look, take a look at both candidates. I mean, take a look at. I think there are some differences, some varying differences. They're all within that blue margin that uh, Dr. Guetta has spoken about. But I do think this is where you have to go back and kind of, people will tell you who to vote for and they have strong feelings of why, but I think it always comes back to, you have to do your own research. It's not the sexy thing, but you really do have to. 
Um, and that goes even to ballot measures. Um, because you otherwise, we end up saying a lot of the talking points that we hear on TV, you know, power is important. But when you break down and say to the issues of each candidate, they're, they could both be on the same side, but it's to what degree and how do you feel about it. So I think while the league doesn't endorse candidates, um, we definitely make it easy for you to find out information. I'll do a plug-in for VotersEdge.org. It's a, it's a great way for you to look up candidates um, and also your, your personalized ballot. Um, so I will, I'll chime in. Let me just, two more points. Number one, this book, um, I have an extra one, so I'm going to give it to Kayla to give away. And then I have copies of the, uh, the PowerPoint that we just made. But if for both this book and that PowerPoint, it will be on my website, and it's up here on the, uh, on the um, uh, uh, PowerPoint right here. So it's lmu.edu slash study LA. Okay? You can download this book. You can download, we're going to put the, it'll take us a day or two to put this back up there, so etc. But um, I don't disagree with anything that Tori said, except the sentiment is that. Um, what, what I'm going to have to the last word. You yeah, this no, I will. Here, no, it, here, is. here it is. Here it is. I purposely, did this, no, 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 no. I purposely oh. did this to show that there is tension within the Democratic Party not to run away. And I'm a progressive. Okay. Yeah. I've never agreed with Diane Feinstein my entire life. This is the first time that without any doubt. Okay. Well, and, I'm, and I am a progressive that has never voted for Diane Feinstein. Ever. And I'm not telling you, from a Latino perspective, when you have a power structure that doesn't give way for new people, you create tension. That's all I'm saying, and that we have to understand that. Like any family, we have to have these these effective people. Shush. <laughs> I'm ending this with an observation from my political mentor, Jeff Sunroom, and it is this. Winning isn't everything, but losing isn't anything. Yes. <laughs> This has definitely been the most lively and, <laughs> and vigorous panel that we've had in this group. So um, what a great discussion. We're almost to 12, and, but I know, I'm sure people have questions. If you guys, are you okay sure. staying another sure. 10 minutes? Just yeah. to None of us is going to leave before the other because we're afraid to. Give up the last word. I didn't hear mentioned, but I have seen in the newspapers in terms of people registering for parties, and I think this kind of fuels the issues of the uh, disparate elements within all the parties is the rise of the independent voter. That's the future. That's, that's exactly the future. Right. That's the, that's what and that, people that, are that, doing. That has real ramifications. That has for ramifications for everything in California. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, you know Sherry what? did talk about it. Yeah. Right. Partisan, right? EP or kind of state or you call it a whole other thing. But it's the independent vote. I actually disagree with that completely in terms of the following data. Number one, you're not seeing the Democratic Party decline. It's actually right. increasing a little bit, number one. It's the Republicans for decline, right? <laughs> number two is that it's the way we register voters in that um, and it's gonna change a little bit for the new way we register. Remember, when you register to vote at the DMV, which close to 40% of the people in the way they register, right? You first fill it out at the DMV, and, it, and then you have to literally get out of line and go to another line to finish filling it out that requires you to do the party identification, okay? And so what was happening is that you've been at the DMV for a long time, you finish your stuff, you register to vote, then they, you're, you're registered, but you just haven't finished a couple of other lines because it, was not, it wasn't in the DMV um, uh, a field for the registration. You literally had to go get in another line to then put down what party you were, okay? So are those really people who purposely say, I don't want to register Democrat, Republican, I want to be an independent voter, or people who are tired of being... There's not even a third line that no. says no party preference. No, 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 no. There, was no part, there was no line for party identification. Period. Period. Okay. Oh, no, it has changed. It has changed. Okay. 
Um, but it, it, and so you had a whole generation, and that's what we're seeing now, is you're seeing the uptick of people registering as Democrats as much because of what's happening, but because it's easier now to register as a Democrat or Republican than it was before, okay? Also, given public opinion, when we push those that are registered independents, they will tell you that they're a Democrat or a Republican. By, uh, and that they identify with those parties. And then when you take a look at, at voting um, results, it also indicates that almost, that there are certain independents that are as reliable Democrats or reliable Republicans as others. And when you say, I'm an independent, where's the party, where's the ideology, what does it stand for? There is no, I mean, as disorganized as Democrats are, independents are even more disorganized. There is no such thing as an ideology. And so, when you think well, I'm not the, sure there is among the, the Democratic sure, Party. I would, I, would I, would agree, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, California is one of the few states that had an independent commission to do the apportionment. Yeah, so considering that we're all Democratic now, anyhow, what effect has this had, do you think, over now or going forward on, on who gets selected or, or the different party parties? I actually give that body the uh, credit for having so many Democrats. Had you left it up to the yeah. Democrats, there would actually be less Democrats, ironically. Mm -hmm. Okay? They because, were right, mm -hmm. so they were just trying to protect incumbents and they drove they drew districts that elected the incumbent, not the party. And then they did nonpartisan, it actually led to more Democrats getting elected. Mm -hmm. It's an it's an interesting dynamic. Right? One, one of the purposes of it as I have was to try to moderate, mm -hmm. to get more moderate. And actually what I think is happening, and I don't know if it's related, is that there are, in the state legislature, there are more moderates. There are more business things. There are fewer in the progressive caucus. There are fewer than there were. You know, my best friend is Sheila Kuehl. She was elected in Antonio Virgoza in 1990. 